Today on the Locked On Blues podcast, the St. Louis Blues had a somewhat inconsistent weekend first beating up on the Predators 7-4 to and a real back-to-back thriller of a game and then falling to the Winnipeg Jets in overtime in a game where they arguably didn't even deserve to make it to overtime. So we're talking about all of that. And then if we have time at the end, we're talking about some trade deadline rumors and stuff like that. So make sure you stay tuned. On Blues, your daily podcast on the St. Louis Blues. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Locked On Blues Podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, and your number one source for daily blues content. I'm your host, Josh Hyman, and I'm joined as always. By my band t-shirt wearing co-host. Seems like every Dude, always episode. kiss for my life, bro. Thomas Welch, we got a fun episode for you today. Blues had a real strong game against the Predators, winning 7-4. to four, A little bit closer than it may have indicated. A couple empty net goals at the end. And then fell to the Winnipeg Jets the very next day in rather unconvincing fashion. So we'll be talking about all of that and more. But first, I want to let you guys know that today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet online has you covered this season with more props, odds, lines than ever before. Bet online where the game starts. And I want to thank anyone and everyone out there for making Locked On Blues your first listen, making us part of your daily routine because we are free and available on all podcast platforms. All right, Tommy. So this weekend was a little bit of the the good and the bad with the St. Louis Blues. We saw the offense, you know, carry them to a victory where the defense and goaltending wasn't quite up to par. Came away seven four win. You know, tons of points. Jordan Cairo had three assists. Robert Thomas had a goal or two. They continued up their hot offensive play from the Rangers game. And then the next day, Winnipeg Jets got them to overtime. Probably didn't even deserve to make it to overtime with the way that they played in that third period. So kind of kind of tough to, to evaluate the play of this team because we saw you know a win in, in pretty strong fashion. Again, defense wasn't really there either night. But still, two two very different stories in each of those games. Let's let's talk about the good one first though. Let's save the the painful talk for the second segment. The Blues did win 7 to 4 over division rival Nashville Predators. Wasn't like I said, wasn't quite as as drastic of a victory as the score would indicate. Two empty net goals at the end, but still lots of positives. Tommy, where do you think we should start in terms of who to praise? I think for the longest time we've been talking about Robert Thomas on this podcast and how dynamic and how electric he's been since the all-star break. And really he's been the driving force for this team since the all-star break. I mean, he's, he's been above and beyond uh, what you've asked for from the guy and what we've seen from earlier this season. And I think he's been above and beyond the best player for the St. Louis blues. That being said, I think someone is closely uh, quickly catching up to him in terms of production and the impact that he has on uh, the blues games lately. And it's a guy who's been quiet for most of the season and was screamingly loud last season. That is David Perron. So I think that's where we need to start, Josh. Uh, He's got 14 points in 14 games played since the All-Star break. Uh, He's got an absurd amount of goals. Six goals in the month of March, right? Six goals in the month of March, and that's only in six games played, and that also Mm. doesn't count his assists. So uh, when you talk about a man on fire, David Perron absolutely fits that description. Playing out of his mind playing out of his mind and I think a lot of people including myself need to do a little bit of uh, introspective searching and realize that uh, I think I've said it up before on this podcast but the guy had a concussion earlier this season uh, he came down with COVID he pulled his groin he never really got into that rhythm and Josh we were talking about workload and the amount of games that the Blues have already played in this month uh, obviously it's tough on any team uh, especially with some guys dealing with injuries uh, to be playing as many games as, as they have in such rapid succession. But in terms of a rhythm, I think it's a, a great way for someone like David Perron to get hot again. And you kind of got to look inwards in yourself and be like, where did I think David Perron was going to be this season compared to last season? He wasn't up to expectations, obviously. Um, but I don't think that's conducive to the player that he is because I think he's much more the player that we're seeing right now, which is a point-per-game guy when he's firing on all cylinders and much more closer to the player that we saw last season. So you got to ask yourself, he's a free agent at the end of the season, and 
do you bring the guy back? I think right now with the way that he's playing, absolutely. the answer is absolutely yes. And he'll not take, just I mean, because, he'll take a discount too. He won't be as expensive as he is right now. That's exactly why. This guy's not going to cost you like five mil and he's not going to take Doug Armstrong out to the bank um, or out to the shed. But he wants to be in St. Louis. He's proven that over his career. He wants to help this team win. He helped bring this team a Stanley Cup. I'm sure he wants nothing more than to help this team do it again. Um, and he is the perfect player to do so because he can bring production like we're seeing right now, that which is just absolutely off the charts. He's a sniper. He's throwing pucks on net that have eyes and are uh, finding the back of the twine consistently. And you can get him for cheap. That's a win-win for everyone involved. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, his his resurgence is nothing short of spectacular. I think, you know, there, there have been moments this year where we've seen – the David Perron of old, but like you said, he just never really had the ability to get up to full speed, especially with like the beginning of the year, the concussion. I, there were moments on this podcast where we speculated whether or not he was going to return at all this season. Just given given his history with head injuries and concussions and the fact that it was being kept so hush-hush under the table, you know, we were like, David Perron can't really expect much out of him if he even does return this season. And now he comes back, and yeah, we were a little hard on him. We were a little, you know, it was a little frustrating to see all the veterans really kind of dropped the ball in terms of what their past production had been, David Perron included. And now all of a sudden, post-All-Star break, we just see an absolute man on fire, to steal a, a term from your, your vocab list. Um, but he's been great, and it's been great to have a guy with that sort of veteran presence really re reignite the Blues offense. You know, we saw in that Rangers game, they put up six goals, and then in the, the very next game against the Predators, they put up seven goals. You know, anytime you put up 13 goals over the course of two games, it, it's it's going to be a recipe for success. And we saw that. Uh, the unfortunate thing is, you know, the defense was, was a, I don't want to say just the defense, but defensively the Blues were still allowing a lot of goals. So, you know, when the offense goals even a little cold like they did against Winnipeg, which we'll get into a little bit later, it wasn't quite enough. But David Perron is the guy that has been leading the charge uh, and and really just allowing his line mates and his teammates to play off of him and have a lot of success. That's why we've seen, you know, the other, other poise fall where they are, even when it's not David Perron. It, when you've got a guy like that, a veteran presence that's that's leading the offense as well as David Perron is, it's going to open the door for other players to have opportunities. Yeah, I think so too. And I think obviously, I mean, they're both divisional games, so it's gonna you you go you want to go out and show the Nashville Predators that you mean business, especially because they're trailing close behind you uh, in the division. So I, I don't want to come out here and say that the Blues uh, just emptied the tank against the Predators and maybe didn't come out full force against the Winnipeg Jets, but I felt oh, like the Winnipeg Jets, it, it's possible, right? And it felt like both of those games were very back and forth, uh, much like divisional games usually are. Just felt like the Blues kind of came out flat in that third period and didn't really play to win as much as they did like playing to not lose. I think anytime you get caught doing that against any team, uh, it's going to come back and bite you. But thankfully the blues uh, still squeaked out a point in a game that, like you said, Josh, uh, I think a lot of people expected them not to, but uh, they get to, it's a little bit of a, of of a relax now because the blues only have two games this week. There's one on Thursday against uh, the penguins and there's one on Saturday, I believe against the blue jackets. So it can kind of regroup now guys that, we're sucking wind or maybe gassed or maybe not feeling a hundred percent can kind of rest up and take it easy. And uh, like I said, regroup and see where this team is at now against a Penguins team. That's uh, still very frightening and very tough to play against as we saw earlier this season and a Columbus team that you can't take uh, advantage of and I can't take for granted when they've got a guy like Lamborghini mercy in that. So uh, all, t- all those things taken into consideration, I think, I, I like where this Blues team is at. We were worried about the offense slowing down and going silent. That obviously has not been the case. I mean, David Perron has picked up the slack. Robert Thomas was out sick, but, I mean, he's still playing at the height of his game. We talked about Jordan Cairo not even playing his best hockey mm-hmm. right now. He still had three assists over the weekend. So um, I think taking all of those things into consideration, we saw a Vladimir Tarasenko goal again too. So I think this Blues team is trending in the right direction, and I think we talked about it a couple episodes ago ago before but they know what it takes to get to the playoffs and they know that this is the home stretch and it's if there was ever a time for them in the course of the season to empty the tank it's going to be as they near and get closer and closer to where these points are going to matter the most they know that you know that the coaches know that everybody knows that so um 
you're going to get guys playing through injuries. You're going to get guys having ups and downs. But at the end of the day, I think this team is going to put themselves in a position to succeed uh, going into the playoffs and going into the trade deadline. Uh, as Doug Armstrong said, he knows that and is trying to add to this team defensively uh, where it feels like they have a weak point. So uh, who knows? It, it could be it, it hasn't been an eventful trade deadline yet. And it feels like it's been really quiet, but a lot of times I feel like in the past that we felt like it's been quiet and nothing was going to happen. All Something of a sudden, just comes like, out of nowhere. One domino just hits and then 74 trades come through and you're spinning. Yep. Wondering what the hell just happened. So yeah. So we're going to be see what happens for sure. We're talking a little bit about the trade deadline and then a little bit more about that Winnipeg game in the second and third segments. But first I want to tell you guys about a brand new sponsor we have now. Our next partner has a product that I literally use every day. I started taking athletic greens because with a hectic college schedule, moving off the classes every day, being home for 15 minutes between classes, it's unfortunately way too easy to eat like crap, throw a bowl of ramen in the microwave or whatever. And yeah, it fills up your stomach, but by the by midday, you're you're regretting it. I started t- taking athletic greens because it's easy, it's convenient, and it helps me feel good. With one tube of athletic greens, you're absorbing 75 high quality minerals, whole food source su- superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging, all the things important for your day-to-day gut health. Like I said, it's real easy. You just put a scoop of it in your water, it it just with any meal, and it really just adds a whole nother level to your day-to-day health. It's lifestyle friendly too. So whether you're eating keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or you're not on any specific diet, you can still fit it in pretty easily. No, you don't have to make any big changes. And the best part is they, they focus a lot on sustainability and values. In, two, in 2020, Athletic Green purchased carbon credits that support projects project, protecting old growth rainforests, rainforests. And for every purchase, they donate to organizations helping to get nutritious food to help kids in need, including No Kid Hungry right here in the U.S. In fact, in 2020, AG donated over 1.2 million to kids in 2020. So right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition, all while helping a good cause, especially heading into the flu and cold season. The last thing you want is your immune system to be low. No fun in that. So that's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash NHL network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance, and we'll be right back. All right, Tommy. So unfortunately, although the Blues won a couple games in impressive fashion, they did lose a game in pretty embarrassing fashion. You know, we talk about Money Puck on this uh, podcast a little bit, and one thing that moneypuck.com has that's a little telling is a deserve to win a meter, and basically it runs 1,000 simulations of the game as it was played with all the the scoring chances and if it went one way, if one post went in, whatever. They run a thousand simulations of the game. And in 82% of those simulations, the Winnipeg Jets won. It was not close. The Blues weren't in that game back and forth. Yeah, sure, it, they had their chances here and there. But by every sense of the imagination, the Winnipeg Jets deserve to win this game. Now, I'm going to pose to you two different scenarios. Are you A, disappointed in the St. Louis Blues that following two really strong victories, they came out against a divisional opponent and basically handed the game to them or B came out gassed after playing six. They're playing their sixth game in 14 days, their second game in as many days against a divisional opponent where they had no business being in and got outplayed from puck drop the final buzzer and still managed to earn a point. Are you glass half full or glass half empty? I feel like I'm, both, both? <laughs> and, I, and I, yeah i'll try to i'll try to explain why so i'm i'm glass half full in the sense that i do think coming out of there with a point in playing the amount of games and the amount of days that they did and being gassed playing divisional opponents and a rangers team that it's very hard to play against i mean you're gonna you're gonna have games like that where you just come out gassed and the legs aren't there and i think that's potentially what the blues happened against a lesser opponent in the winnipeg jets but that being said I think I'm disappointed appointed because I saw a lot of similarities in the Winnipeg Jets team and the way that it's constructed and the way that the St. Louis Blues are currently constructed. And what I mean by that is uh, it, it feels like the Winnipeg Jets have a pretty high-powered offense with guys like Kyle Connor and Shifley and all these guys. Like, they, don't, they don't lack in their ability to score. 
And obviously, Connor Hellebuck is one of the best goalies in the entire league. I think he's got the most shots faced out of any goalie in the entire league. So uh, that tells you uh, everything you need to know about their defense, right? They rely heavily on their goaltending and heavily on their offensive production to win them games. Their defense isn't going to go out and earn a whole bunch of shutouts, even though Connor Hellebuck can stand on his head and do that by himself sometimes. It's not... It's not typically how they're going to go out there and win games, right? And I think for the Blues, that's kind of the construction and the way that they're looking at success right now is because they do have a high-octane offense and they do have a lot of guys that can put the puck in the back of the net. And Billy Husso is looking like one of the best goalies in the league this season in his smaller sample size than some of the other guys in the league. But that being said, you can only do so much with two facets of the game. And I think... Um, Every trial and error that the Winnipeg Jets have could easily be the trial and error that the St. Louis Blues face later on towards the end stretch of the season and even into the playoffs. And um, those small, minute details, I mean, small, minute, that's a third of the game, but uh, something like that is an easy in for a team to kind of target. Uh, and that could prove to be the difference in a, an entire seven game series. So um, I know. A lot of people, and I know uh, our guest Hayden, STL Sports Central, said maybe the Blues should just not do anything at the trade deadline. But I think to really compete with some of these big dogs, you have to uh, address the need that is defense, whatever it may be. It's just It doesn't have to be Jacob Chickard, even though I think that moves the needle a ton. But even just adding anyone uh, to that left side of the defense and moving guys around, maybe Mikula is not in a top spot anymore, can move down to a third pairing, which I feel like is a lot more his style and the way that he plays and would pair with Bertuzzo really nicely uh, getting in fights and getting under guys' skin. So even just a little move there, I think uh, moves the needle a lot closer to the Stanley cup for the St. Louis blues than just not doing anything. So that's kind of where my head is at and what I was looking at when I watched the Winnipeg Jets game. Yeah. I think we should definitely get into that a little bit more here in the third segment, especially with Jacob Schickering going down to injury it kind of complicates things a little bit. And, uh, you know, the fact that we really haven't seen a whole lot um, up until this point, you usually see some kind of the the breadcrumbs being laid in terms of initial smaller trades. We've literally only seen one trade so far. So definitely a, a, a curious start to trade deadline season. So we're we'll talking about all of that and more in our final segment of today's episode. But first, I want to tell you guys about Bet Online. Now, if you guys think you got some some hot takes of, oh, yep, Jick went to the Blues. They're winning the Stanley Cup. Put your money where your mouth is. Check out betonline.net because it's that time of year as the college basketball tournament is finally upon us. From all the latest odds, contests, and player props, betonline.net is the number one source for all your sports betting needs and info. Josh Bet is Online all. for March Madness, college basketball. Yeah. Yep, Wisconsin. Uh, I, ooh, they. I think I have them in my in my final two. I made my bracket early. I, like I think that. I had. I, like I think that. I had Gonzaga winning it on my limited research. But it's I'll get. Choice. I'll get back to you. I'll get back to you. That's the easy. I think Gonzaga will definitely be in the top up. four. So well, if you think if you're like Tom, you want to put your money in your mouth. It's like I said, check out Bet Online. But it's not just basketball. Bet Online is your continued source for all your sporting wagering information needs, including live betting and your favorite Vegas casino games. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet online where the game starts. And before we get back, I want to tell you guys about a classic sponsor, and that is Built Bar. Now, Built Bar has this brand new product. I'm sure you've heard about it if you listen to the show. That is called Built Puffs. If you haven't Puff heard about Daddy. them, you're missing out. It's literally, it's literally protein used marshmallow. Those words do not belong together in a sentence, but they do, and they're delicious. They're fluffy. They're marshmallowy. They're not just a protein bar. They're a treat, and they're covered in 100% Real chocolate. Puffs are a fan favorite with some incredible flavors. Sim cinnamony churro, say that five times fast. Coconut marshmallow, banana cream pie, so good. They're gonna be your new favorite. And all bars, including the puffs, are covered in 100 percent real chocolate. You know, you may be thinking, a bar covered fully in chocolate, that can't be good for you. Surprise, it is. Most built bars contain 130 calories, four grams of sugar, four net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. Compare that to a candy bar which usually has around 240 calories, 30 grams of sugar, and dozens of net carbs, mint brownie, coconut, coconut almond, and so many more. They have so many delicious flavors. So check out Built.com. Use promo code LOCK15, and you'll get 15% off your order. That's promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at Built.com. And all right, Tommy, so we're getting close to the end of this episode, but we do have a little bit of time for Trade Deadline Talk. Now, in your opinion, does Jacob Shikarin's injury 
scare you off a little bit from acquiring him if you're the St. Louis Blues? Are you still all in? I think if you're the St. Louis Blues, you're actually more all in because of the injury than you were in the first place. And because, uh, bear with me here, okay? So the asking price for Jacob Chikrin, uh, reported numerous times by Elliot Friedman, has typically been a young NHL player, like young NHL ready player, uh, a young promising prospect and a first round pick. They're looking for like that Eichel kind of package, right? And so if you're the St. Louis Blues, like that's a lot to give up, especially like the first round pick, all those things. Even if you feel like the guy is worth it, like do you give up a guy like Jake Neighbors? Do you give up a guy like Scott Prunovich? And even now Scott Prunovich is having surgery. So if you're Arizona, are they even interested in that? If you're Arizona, you're probably interested in Billy Huso, but obviously the St. Louis Blues need to rely on him right now to make it through the Stanley Cup. So do you do that? There's a whole lot of questions surrounding this and whether or not um, the Blues would be able to be to facilitate that trade or even be interested in that. And I think one of the problems and why we haven't seen a Jacob Chikrin trade happen yet so far with anybody is everyone was kind of waiting for them to bring down the asking price because they felt like it was too high. And the Arizona Coyotes did not budge one bit. They said, we have no problem not moving this guy. This is what we want to move him for. Pay it or don't. We don't care. Now, yeah. it feels like they wanted to move him, and he's injured now, so they almost are forced to bring down his asking price because he's not 100%. And I feel like that benefits all the teams, but especially the St. Louis Blues, because I think if Arizona didn't end up budging on their price, the Blues wouldn't have been able to do it. Now, there's a whole lot of things happening with this trade deadline, and I don't know. I, it feels like everything surrounding Jacob Chikrin makes it difficult for it to happen, especially, like I said, with Perunovic now getting surgery. I feel like that would have been smart thing to do, give him a prospect D-man for a D-man that you know is a little bit more solidified and could potentially be that number one guy for him. But I think one of the, one of the biggest things, and I tweeted it out today, is the Blues have been consistently scouting uh, – the Philadelphia Flyers and the Flyers scouts have been scouting the Blues uh, AHL team, the Thunderbirds. And so I, I think they asked Darren Pang. I think they asked Panger about it on the broadcast. And he was like, I don't know why the Blues would be interested in Claude Drew. It just doesn't make sense. Like they all have a very deep offense and they're probably deepest at center. So why would you bring in a guy that just kind of, you don't really know where you're going to put him. Like right. Claude Giroux on the third line doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Robert Thomas on the third line doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And you're not putting Ryan O'Reilly there. So like, what do you do with a guy? Right. But I think because Colorado is so interested in Claude Giroux and they can easily facilitate that now that Landis Gog is on long-term injured reserve. I think the blues uh, were concerned about that this entire time and now even more concerned about it. So they kind of scouted out uh, the flyers as a muse and said, Hey, we're interested in Claude Giroux to drive up the asking price when in reality they're interested in Sanheim and Provorov. And I don't know if the Flyers would be interested in moving Provorov, but Elliot Freeman did mention it on his 32 Thoughts, um, one of his most recent episodes. So if you haven't checked that out, highly recommend. But those could potentially be pieces moving. And I feel like one of those two guys would make the most sense out of anybody for Doug Armstrong because – I tweeted this out before too, but if you're Doug Armstrong and the asking price for Ben Sherratt is a first round pick, I don't think there's any way that he's paying that. So that's where yeah. my head's at with this entire, entire right. trade deadline. I think the Blues and the Flyers make a deal for some kind of defenseman. Um, but if the Blues get Chikrin, I'll be stoked. If the Blues get Sherratt for not a first round pick, I'll be stoked. But that's kind of what I'm looking at right now. Yeah, um, you couldn't have couldn't have uh, described my opinion any better. It's it is perfect. Like. I'm, I wouldn't be thrilled with Ben Sherratt. Um, mm. Like I'm not going to say no, but it really depends on the asking price. You know, like I, I don't want it to be sort of a last, like a compensation thing. Like, oh, we couldn't get Chigger and couldn't get Sandheim. Let's throw a first at this guy. You know, he was really good with Shea Weber when Carey Price was playing like the best hockey player in the world. Um, what kind of trade for Ben Sherratt would you be okay with? Just out of curiosity, because I feel like it's difficult Marco too Scandella because the Blues, because the and Blues like a don't. Third. Yeah, I, I, I'd chill with that. I think, but I mean, that's, I mean, if they're asking for a first, I don't think that that's getting needle. done. But I, it's tough because the Blues don't have a second this year. So if you're if they're giving away their first round pick, they're dropping immediately to the third round, and I just don't think that 
Like, yeah. like the Blues have drafted well in the first round. Even Bullduck looks like a stud on his team uh, this season. But they've drafted in the second round well too, right? But I, if you're dropping that far to the third and that's your first pick in the entire draft, I just don't think that that's worth it. I you know? Yeah, I agree. I definitely think it would take a lot to pry a first out of Doug Armstrong's hands at this moment. Uh, but they have been... I mean, I think there was a period there where we didn't have a first in like three straight drafts just because we kept trading it away. Like I think Shen, O'Reilly, something else, something mm-hmm. like that. Um, so if the right deal is there, Armstrong will make it. But the flip side is if the right deal isn't there, Doug Armstrong isn't going to try to force a square peg through a round hole. You know, we're not we're not going to see a, tra- a move being made just for the sake of making a move. So I think in the coming days as the, the trade – landscape is laid out i think the blues are going to be kind of one of the later guests to show up to the party if that makes sense like i don't think they're going to be one of the teams that's you know firing off the the first domino of trades i think they're going to wait and see like okay yeah we got outbid for chickering because they're not going to get into a bidding war if if there's some other team that's just artificially inflating the asking price because they want x player more than x team blues aren't going to do that they're going to get a guy for what he's worth maybe a little bit more and that's it you know so I think once we sort of see some of the trades, what the what the market is bearing, like we saw Josh Manson today go for a, a second round pick and a, a prospect defenseman. So that's kind of a good indication of, in my opinion, what a guy like Ben Sherratt would go for. Um, so once we see some more trades that kind of, like I said, set the market, then I think we could see a little bit more action in terms of what Doug Armstrong is really thinking, what he's really going after. But until then... You know, I'm honestly under the assumption that this team is going to be pretty similar post trade deadline than it is now. Um, I don't think Ben Sherratt moves a needle a ton. I think he'd be a welcome addition. You know, a guy like that, I would be very, very surprised if the Blues go out and get a big needle mover in the terms of Claude Giroux, Travis Sandheim, Jacob Chickering, Ivan Provorov, et cetera, et cetera. But hey, I've been wrong before. So I would love to be wrong about this. I'd love to have a, a new star in inner Blues uniform to root for. I actually also think I disagree with you. Actually, really, you said you said well, you said that uh, you don't think that the Blues will be one of the first domino pushers. You think uh, they will? The tri- I think they will, and because I think if the Blues and whoever they're trading with, if it's the Flyers, if it's whoever, uh, make a move for someone that's not Chikrin and not Sharat, they're Ooh. gonna want to do it when those two are still available because they want. To have, they want the other team to have the idea in their mind that they can go elsewhere. They, they, they aren't forced to do a, a deal with them to get what they need, right? And so because the second that those guys are off the board, the asking price for whoever they're dealing with is going to go up because he's one of the last D-men available. So if, if, they're, if they're doing a trade when there's more D-men available, the asking price is going to be lower, in my opinion. So that's why I think Doug Armstrong would actually trade – closer to the start of the deadline as opposed to the end of the deadline but who knows we'll see what happens that's a, yeah you know what well maybe that'll be today's pinned comment will the blues be go. a will the blues be an early action taker or are they gonna kind of wait in for the, the shadows anchor. for the time to, to for the right time to strike definitely could be two different approaches to the trade deadline for sure and could have a pretty drastic impact on not only how the rest of the season goes but the rest of this the length of this blues core goes if it is a guy like jacob chicker and we could be seeing a completely different blues team over the next few years so who knows a lot could change over the next what 10 days is it mm, seven seven oh my 21st. goodness seven days one week from today oh baby a lot could change i'm gonna be on spring break so let's hope i'll be sit- sitting on the beach with some uh some good news on, on my <laughs> phone in my hand that would be that would be nice. So uh, yeah, make awesome. sure you guys make sure you guys stay tuned for that. Lots to talk about in the coming seven days. I'm sure there's going to be plenty of content, plenty of emergency podcasts. I'm sure there's gonna be times where we're sitting here recording, like, oh yeah, so Doug Armstrong did nothing today, and then Tommy's gonna check his phone and like give me that look, and then it's like, oh, just mm-hmm. kidding, we traded for blah blah blah. So it's gonna be hectic. I'm really looking forward to it. One of the first, you know, trade deadlines that we're gonna be able to really cover in full detail here that where the blues are looking to make some big moves. So if you want to stay tuned with all of that, make sure you hit that follow or subscribe button on whatever podcast platform you're listening to us on. Leave us a review if you're feeling so kind. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Hit that notification bell. That way, whenever an episode goes out, they're usually right around the same time or even before the episode goes live on 
you know, your various audio listening platforms. So if you kind of want to be the in the know, get the the less edited, see our beautiful faces, all that good stuff, subscribe to our YouTube at Locked On Blues. Subscribe to or follow all of our social accounts, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok at Locked On Blues. Follow me on Twitter at Josh Hyman NHL. Follow Tommy. Oh, wrong way. Tommy on Twitter, that guy, at TWelcher15. Thanks so much for listening, and as always, let's go Blues.